And are you going to pull the, the picture up bigger or leave it that way? Oh, the, uh, the computer that I have actually does not have a uh, PowerPoint on it. So this is the, okay. this is the first Fine. screen that I'm going to have. Good, good. And then we can see people, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, just tell me when we're live. So we are good to go. We're recording now, so you can start whenever you're ready. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad that you are joining us here tonight uh, with our very first webinar uh, sponsored by the Environmental Advisory Council. I am Janet Cravenas. I am a member of our Newtown Square Environmental Advisory Council, and I am also the bird person for our bird town uh, certification with um, Audubon. So we are here tonight to celebrate uh, gardening with nature in mind. And we have a number of events that are planned for this week. Uh, starting with this evening, we have our first Zoom uh, and webinar uh, uh, call with uh, featuring Mike McGraw, I will do a more proper uh, uh, introduction uh, 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 just a little bit later. But I also wanted to mention that on Saturday, we have our native plant pop-up garden that is opening to uh, our residents or anyone who might be driving by on uh, Bishop Hollow Road, the corner of Bishop Hollow and Ellis Road at the administration building. This pop-up garden is plants that are not actually in the ground, but staying in their pots. They are native plants, good for this particular location, good for our environment, as well as for the pollinators and the birds that uh, depend on pollinating um, caterpillars, or the caterpillars of pollinators to raise their babies. Uh, after the uh, pop-up garden is at the administration building for a week, it's going to move to uh, the St. Albans Circle and be part of the Gather in the Circle. And uh, so it'll have a, another opportunity to uh, interact with uh, people that are, will be coming through that area. And our other event, uh, another webinar will be on May the 12th with Finn Smith. He is president of Valley Forge Audubon and he'll be walking us through the steps of converting his front yard into a native plant habitat, or, or I would say a native plant sanctuary. So those are the activities that we have planned coming up. And we hope you will definitely come to the pop-up garden uh, on the 8th uh, through the 15th to, to enjoy uh, the plants that are there and the signage that we have. Uh, next slide, Nick. Um, before we start, I wanted to thank our sponsors for this um, event, all of our events. We had a wonderful grant from Audubon, Pennsylvania, and another one from Valley Forge Audubon to help with the plants that we are putting in and the graphics that we're using. Uh, our garden design and plant selection was designed by Tyler Arboretum. Uh, and so they've given us a wonderful map, I would call it, for uh, our, putting our plants out there for us all to see. Plant material, Mastardi's Nursery has been invaluable in providing the plant, uh, plants for us that we can uh, move into this garden. Uh, so we really uh, encourage you to go down to Mastardi's Nursery. They have a whole side of uh, native plants uh, then And their signage is uh, such that you can understand what kinds of uh, butterflies and uh, birds uh, visit the particular plants that are there. And uh, tomorrow, for our installation, our community volunteers uh, are going to be helping. They are from Newtown Square and Bloom, Parks and Recreations, some from uh, Gather in the Circle, and Newtown Township's Public Works, and a shout out to George Sherry, who has just been instrumental in helping us put everything together. Finally, Willistown Conservation Trust, which is in our backyard, has helped us to uh, 
make plant uh, signs for the individual species that we have, uh, since not all of them will be in a uh, bloom. Um, but you know, our, our garden is one that plant or pop it down and uh, the, the plants will bloom and the pollinators will come. So if they're not in bloom now, they will be. Maybe another reason to visit the garden more than once. And again, this is sponsored by Newtown Township Advisory Council. So since we are on a webinar and I've made done a lot of them this winter, getting me through the winter on plants and gardens and pollinators, uh, I think what we have here is an opportunity to ask a question in the chat box. If you put it there, I think Nick is, Nick is uh, shaking his head that that's the way we should should uh, ask questions. And I know we we welcome your questions, uh, especially from our speaker tonight, who is an expert. Uh, he again uh, this. Mike McGraw, he's a wildlife biologist and ecologist, and he performs extensive varieties uh, of the surveys with reptiles, amphibians, and avifaunal, aviofaunal, is that right, Mike? Avifaunal, yeah. Okay, in Earth. Eastern Earth. and Midwestern US. Uh, a strong emphasis on endangered, threatened, and species of concern, and beyond survey and research, his work as a consulting scientist includes project design, permitting, project management, client relations, as well as writing reports. That's the fun part, isn't it? Um, <laughs> anyway, he has been intimately involved in our own Newtown Meadow Preserve, which is 52 acres. And I think he's gonna start by telling us a bit about our meadow, uh, which is on, which is part of a, um, was it bird area? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, we're, so a, a good chunk of Newtown Township falls within a corridor that's designated as an important bird uh, area, an IBA by yes. Pennsylvania Audubon. It's it's associated with Ridley Creek State Park and actually Willistown Conservation Trust has a number of properties that have some important birds on them. We're within that corridor, so there's a huge opportunity to promote some some rare and at-risk bird species alongside common ones at Newtown Meadows. Great. Well, I'm going to turn it over to you now, Mike. Uh, Great. And well, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Janet. Thanks, Nick. Uh, hi, everyone. I can't see your faces, but I assume you're all smiling enthusiastically and excited to uh, have a conversation about uh, gardening in your backyard with the thought of thinking about wildlife. Um, I think there's some really cool opportunities. Some of you are probably already pros at this and I could learn more from you than you could from me regarding how to get plants in the ground and getting them to stay alive. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about my maiden voyage right now with converting lawn to meadow. Um, but uh, while I'm uh, chatting here, Nick, if it's all right, I'll share my screen. Cool. And you should be good to share. Great. You. I think if I do, uh, this may work. Let's see. There oh, it is. looks like it's you. Good. Yeah, I think I need to uh, share the actual presentation. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Screen. Uh, Up top, sorry. slideshow. Yeah, the problem is when I hit it, it opens up, but, oh, there we go. Okay, good. Can you guys see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, as Janet mentioned, my name is Mike McGraw. Uh, I was a Newtown Square resident. I was actually on the Environmental Advisory Committee for a number of years. I think I even made it up to like vice president, vice chair or something at one point. <laughs> wonderful group uh, of folks, wonderful township. Um, I have since moved all around. I, I just recently bought a house in Broomall. Um, my ex-wife lives in Newtown Square, still right by the police station, so I'm in the town all the time. Um, and uh, I am excited to talk to you guys about some, some cool wildlife opportunities in our region related to your own yard. Um, this is a, um, a northern mockingbird perched in a non-native shrub, 
um, but this is a, a suburban uh, image right here. Um, this guy right here is a red shoulder hawk that I photographed in my backyard. I live in Broomall right near the high school. Um, and we have Cooper's hawk, red shouldered hawk, and red tailed hawk all nesting on my block, which is pretty cool. Um, and uh, this guy was perch foraging <laughs> eastern garter snakes along my fence line uh, when Ooh. I took this photo. Um, so here's the outline. I'm going to talk a little bit more about myself, if you'll tolerate that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, wildlife habitat basics, um, plant and animal interactions at this scale, at the suburban backyard scale. And then I'll provide some project examples. Most of the projects I engage are much larger. So I've, I've given some examples that are relevant in scale that'll hopefully inspire some good questions and, and get you guys fired up about um, continuing or, or you know, taking your maiden voyage on a, on a lawn to meadow conversion or using native plants for landscaping. Uh, and then hopefully we'll have some time for discussion. I'd welcome questions. So um, about me, uh, I am definitely a local boy. I was born in Springfield, Delco. Um, I went to St. Joe's Prep for high school. Um, so I was in the city. I got my, my bachelor's degree uh, from uh, Drexel University in environmental science with a focus on ecology. Um, this is where my, I was able to connect my childhood passion and interest for wildlife with a potential career path. I started doing undergraduate research, studying the spatial ecology of timber rattlesnakes and northern pine snakes in the New Jersey Pine Barrens at an Air National Guard bombing range facility. Um, and I just absolutely fell in love with working long, hard hours outdoors, um, tracking rattlesnakes <laughs> in the Pine Barrens. Um, so, uh, um, I, I went right into that field. I, I worked for a small company doing threatened endangered species work, mostly with reptiles and amphibians, eventually birds and plants as well. Um, and then uh, I fell in love with a, with a Delco girl. And uh, at the time I was living in Jersey briefly, you know, fully committed to the Pine Barrens. And um, I moved back home for love, left that job and uh, started with another company called Applied Ecological Services. Um, and uh, moved back to Delco. Um, AES was kind enough to pay for me to go back to school and get my master's degree. So I went to Penn uh, and graduated there in 2015 with a master's uh, in environmental biology. Um, and uh, they were kind enough to invite me to teach ornithology immediately after. So I've been teaching ornithology as an adjunct instructor at Penn since. Um, Janet mentioned Williston Conservation Trust. What an amazing group, um, an amazing resource that we have locally. Um, and uh, I've been doing volunteer work with them for many years and somehow ended up, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a bander in charge for the Solwet L program. If you haven't gone, it's phenomenal. Um, you can meet one of North America's smallest owls. Um, we, we band them there and then they also do songbird banding and there are public days you go on their website, you can try to register. I think it's filled up pretty pretty fast, but um, an amazing, amazing group. Um, and uh, I'm actually on the board of trustees there now as well. Um, and most importantly, I'm a, I'm a proud daddy. I got two little girls and, uh, and as I mentioned, I recently bought a house. So um, I, am, uh, I, am, I am really excited about converting lawn to meadow right now. It's like, what's going on in my life? So. Um, we're going to do just a little wildlife primer first. Um, this could be sort of basic, but, you know, wildlife is dependent on specific elements of the landscape, both biotic and abiotic, meaning like trees and plants and also um, inorganic things like rocks and mineral soil. Um, so an understanding of whether at, uh, wildlife is present or absent within a space really tells you a lot about the functionality of it. That's sort of the premise of most of my work is doing wildlife studies to determine the, condi the ecological condition of a space. It's entirely applicable for a half acre lawn in Delco. So, um, so you know, you look at these two images and this, these were shamelessly pilfered from a, you know, this is just some wildflower meadow in the UK, but you know, in general, they look pretty similar, right? But if you notice on the right, there's a tree line that could be a predator perch or a place for a raptor to nest. So that's gonna have direct implications on what sorts of wildlife uses these open spaces. Um, 
Another thing to look at is the plant species diversity, right? Not, not all plants are created equally. And we'll talk a little bit about the chemical makeup and the, the evolutionary interaction of plants and animals and how that, um, what plants you select mean a lot. And that's, that, that's really the foundation for why you should choose native plants if possible. So we'll go into that. This is an image of a corner blue butterfly which has only one host species, Lupinus perennis. Wild blue lupin is the only plant that the caterpillar form of this animal can consume. It's the only plant it can digest. If not, if it's not there, this 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 butterfly won't won't exist. Um, <clears throat> so, looking at the configuration, and this will be less applicable on a smaller scale, but you know, here you see the picture on the right. It's the it's wildflower meadow from end to end. On this other one, it's a strip. Right, so the configuration, the spatial ecology, is it round, is it long and skinny, is it a big block, et cetera. Something to consider with your planting arrangements, especially if you have particular targets in mind with your backyard. Also making sure, and Janet just mentioned that the pop-up garden is gonna have some plants that aren't flowering currently, they're gonna be in their vegetative state. That's good, right? You don't wanna show, a, a no one space should have just plants that bloom in April or just April and May. Right, you wanna have a, a successional cascade of blooming plants, not only for aesthetic value, but for functional value, providing important sugar water, that nectar for insect species that emerge and you know enact their life cycle at different times in spring, summer, and even fall. Monarch butterflies are the, are the phenomenal example of a species that really depends in our region on late flowering plants, mostly asters and uh, um, plants within the Asteraceae family um, that can bloom in September and even into October when these animals are migrating down to Mexico. Um, is there water or not, right? On the left, there's this narrow patch of water. If so, it really opens the door for a huge diversity of other plants and, and the wildlife that's, that's supported by those plants. So, you know, is it a wet site? Is it a dry site, et cetera? And then management. And this is probably the biggest one for a yard, right? Um, you know, it's, since I've moved, since I bought a house in Burma, um, you know, all last year and this year, it's already fired up. Almost every single morning is started with a weed whacker and a lawnmower firing up, right? Everybody's cutting grass. That regular, regular maintenance, and think about it, if you're, you know, if you're a small animal, it's a, that, that type of maintenance uh, can be daunting, right? It's a daunting, a dangerous place to be uh, if there's blades swinging all the time. So, how a site is managed. And so um, the example here, I'm showing a bobble link. It's a photo I took on one of our restoration sites. It's a grassland breeding bird. Um, often they'll be in hay fields. If those hay fields are if harvested in June, it's an ecological sink, right? They'll show up, these birds will show up, they'll lay their, they'll defend the territory, they'll pair up, they'll breed, they'll lay eggs, they'll start raising those young. And when those young are vulnerable in the nest, when the lawnmower, come, the, you know, the the combine comes through and collects the hay, then it's a fail, right? It's, a, it's all that effort is for naught, essentially. So um, often we work with um, people that are haying to just, if they can only wait until July 15th, right? Then let those birds fly. So thinking about when and how you manage your space um, could greatly improve the value of your space for wildlife. And then lastly, um, your soils. Soils are everything. I mean, it's not dirt, guys. It's soil, right? It's a, um, a uh, there's a good spoonful of soil could have literally millions of microorganisms in it, um, representing hundreds of different taxa, fungi and my, and uh, bacteria and viruses. If people hear bacteria and virus and freak out. There's so many that are absolutely critical to life functionality. Just your your digestive system alone has hundreds of different bacteria that are absolutely required just for you to eat a cheeseburger or a, or a salad, whatever you choose. Um, so um, going in a little further on that, you know, just basic trophic interactions. The trophic is, um, you know, um, we're just talking about different tiers. If you imagine like the food pyramid or a ladder, um, you know, the different trophic levels, um, plants are, are producers, primary producers, right? And then primary, uh, the first consumers, primary consumers are the next trophic level, secondary consumers are the sec third trophic level, et cetera. Um, so 
your herbivores, your plant eating animals are typically your primary consumers. Bur uh, butterflies are a great example, right? They're this whole metabolic insect. They, their larval state is a caterpillar with these rudimentary mouth parts and they, they're just built to chew. It's just chew, chew, chew to eat leaves, vegetative matter. Uh, and then once they enact in, uh, um, uh, when they go through um, their metamorphosis into an adult phase, those basic cells for chewing become really complex feeding parts. These really crude eyes become really complex eyes. These leg stumps essentially to just hold on to a branch while chewing on it become these multi-segmented things with hairs and hooks and you know nerve endings. Um, really, really amazing process. But the reason they're called holometabolites is there's a niche partitioning there, right? The, the juveniles never compete with the adults for food, right? The juveniles eat leaves, the adults drink nectar, right? So two different things could be from the same plants or the same meadow, right? The host plant could be vegetative, but in order for that animal to make and act its full cycle, you're gonna to have to have plants, other plants that aren't the host species that are flowering in the same space to feed the adults. So again, there's this theme of diversity being an, uh, an important thing. Um, and uh, that, that process of herbivory, I'll talk briefly about how that's driven speciation, right? Why a plant is different from another plant? Why insects have some, you know, how does a corner blue butterfly ever exist if it only, it has a relationship with one plant, right? And that's because it came from a different species that was more general, but started this, uh, arms race with uh, this this competitive arms race with a particular plant where, you know, the plant develops a uh, uh, an allelochemical, right, a, a toxin to prevent from being eaten. And then that caterpillar develops a mechanism in its digestive system to digest that. And then the plant comes with another response to try and trick it. And then the, the caterpillar tries to outsmart it. And so you have this back and forth that sometimes gets so weird and unique that you get new species, right? So it's just pretty cool. Um, and it all starts with good soil. Here's just, you know, I'm not explaining every last bit of this slide because you can see some of the things I've explained. I didn't talk about higher trophic levels yet though, like dragonflies that hunt insects or wasps that hunt insects or birds that hunt insects or birds that eat seeds or mice that eat seeds, right? So there's really, it gets really complex as you go. And again, the more diversity is a, a, a wonderful example of a uh, of a functional meadow, and these, these this can happen right here in our backyards. It, it, in fact, it is unfolding in your backyard, just to what degree. So, two good examples of uh, those sorts of strategies are these two tree species, and uh, I'm assuming some of you probably know right off the bat what these are. Um, for those of you that don't know, no worries. Um, on the left is Quercus alba. This is a um, or albidum. This is um, white oak, very common, wonderful native plant that occurs in our area. Many of you probably already have this plant growing in your backyard if the deer didn't manage to chew it down before it grew up. Um, and then on the right is Prunus serotina. That's a black cherry. Is a very com That's our common cherry species in our region. So, um, and shameless plug for Doug Tallamy right now, um, amazing local resource this man has done phenomenal studies. Him and myriad uh, graduate students um, have developed this body of data, really studying the insect and plant relationships. Um, and if you're if you're kind, you send him a nice email. He may share with you an Excel spreadsheet that says, "Okay, Quercus alba, white oak," and then there's this laundry list of insect species that are known to rely on this plant to survive to enact their life cycle. Same thing with Prunus serotina, same thing with literally hundreds and hundreds of native plants, be them woodies like trees and shrubs or herbaceous like grasses and wildflowers. Um, so really, really um, interesting. And what you'll see is a lot of oaks and a lot of cherries both have a laundry list of insects that they support. So, but here's what's interesting. Um, white oaks grow a lot slower than black cherries. White oaks, um, and the reason, one of the reasons they grow slower is because they enact a defense mechanism against herbivory that 
is costly. It's at a metabolic cost. They create chemicals that they put into their leaves to make them not terribly palatable. So while insects can get a bunch of nutrition feeding on these leaves, they're limited by it, right? They're, it's And who knows, and you can anthropomorphize to be fun, but you know, are they getting sick? Are they getting drunk or stoned, right? Like there's something that's slowing them down and preventing them from eating all the leaves. Why? Because this plant makes a living photosynthesizing with its leaves, right? That's, that's its moneymaker, um, you know, gathering ultraviolet radiation from the sun and acting photosynthesis. And that's how this animal puts down um, uh, biomass and, and exists. Uh, you know, we'll also talk about the, all the amazing nutrient interaction below ground, but obviously leaves are critically important to the life of a plant. It doesn't want to be eaten, but so they work out this balancing act. Um, so this plant has selected to, and to, to produce these chemicals. And that's at a metabolic cost. So it grows a little slower because it takes time to create these chemicals. Well, Prunus serotina does not do that. Almost every piece of this plant is edible to many, many things, but it's just as successful. It, the plant occurs just as commonly, arguably, if not more commonly in our landscape than of some of the oak species. How, how does it not just get hammered to death, right? Every single leaf just being denuded by caterpillars. Well its strategy is to rely on, a, on another trophic level, right? So because this plant attracts so many insects because they're, it's palatable, we, see, we observe a tritrophic interaction where birds, birds do the, the work for this plant. But so many, many birds have learned the, a great place to get a meal in the springtime is on black cherry trees. And they have more rods and cones than we do from a visual perspective and other amazing senses that we've yet to fully understand. So I'm gonna humbly say that we don't know exactly how this has worked out so well, but we do know for fact that a red-eyed vireo and a chestnut-sided warbler and a worm-eating warbler and a, I mean, you name it, uh, any, ins they call them bark or foliage gleaning insectivores you know, these gorgeous songbirds that migrate through, some stick around and breed, um, they will take their time when they find a Prunus serotina to hunt that, they're, you know, they're searching the leaves, hopping all around upside down and, you know, in the inflorescence, et cetera, looking for insects because they know there's a meal there. The dinner bell is ringing. Um, and the plant, I mean, how amazing is that, that this tree has evolved to rely on birds. I mean, it's a calculated risk, right? To rely on a whole nother, group of vertebrates, right? You, you know, fauna, you know, not even a plant um, to, to, to do the work for them to, to keep uh, their leaves, keep enough leaves to photosynthesize. So really cool, two different strategies. Both are great trees to look in this time of year for birding. Another shameless plug. Um, I'm leading a bird walk with my good buddy, Wynn Schaefer and a couple other birders this weekend. Um, and uh, I'll let Janet or someone else uh, give, provide those details at the end, back end of this presentation. But you know, hopefully, you can see that in action with us this weekend. Um, why do we manage landscapes? A whole bunch of reasons. And uh, forgive me, some of these slides are are newly created. Some I've pulled from another presentation related to wildlife monitoring. This is one of those, but uh, worthy, right? What you know? Sometimes we restore landscapes just because, right? We're interested in what it looked like before Europeans colonized North America, right? What, what, were, what were the, what, what are the American chestnut dominated forests that you know, had 400, 500 year old trees look like? It's fun to consider. Um, so sometimes uh, it's, restoration is driven purely by looking at old systems that used to be here. Food, right? I mean, our food systems, over 80% of, um, uh, Land that you can uh, grow food on, we do. And I do a lot of research in ag lands in the Midwest and up in Canada. Um, so, you know, producing food. And then there's safety reasons. Um, you know, I've lived in and out of the city often, and uh, I've never had the great pleasure of owning a little lot, but uh, every one of them will have some concrete rubble and some broken glass and stuff. You want to clean that up and beautify the area. Um, but, you know, this, this, some of these could also be relevant in the suburbs as well, depending on where you're living. Um, and then I think these really hit home for the, for the homeowner uh, or the long-term renter. 
you know, uh, aesthetics, right? You want to be able to walk in your backyard and feel at peace with nature, have a spiritual or a physical connection with, with all these other living things. Um, and, uh, you know, for someone like me as a nature nerd, I'm just having that stewardship or that responsibility, being able to, to promote and steward biodiversity on my little chunk of land is pretty exciting. The, the, the photo of the prairie warblers there, that's a, um, a detailed study that I assisted with in the Albany Pine Bush Preserve. To the left is a Jefferson salamander that I found there. They're pretty rare. And the, that bottom photo is actually the Japanese garden in West Philadelphia. It's on uh, city land, absolutely stunning. Mostly non-natives, um, but not invasives, right? They're using exotics. And we'll talk a little bit about that too before I'm done. Jaw flapping. Um, so quick little primer on like lawn orogeny. Some of you probably know this, some might be amazed by this. So as back, or this, it's believed that it started back in the 15th century, often around castles, um, purely for defense, right? You'd want to clear your forest so you could see enemies coming from afar and plan accordingly. Um, also um, in small villages, there would be commons, right? You talk about the tragedy of the commons, misuse of public space. Um, there were areas that were open for anyone to graze, which is great, right? If you're a, if you had sheep to make your living or just a couple goats or whatever, they have to eat. If you don't own much land, um, some lords would be kind enough to provide some common ground. And so basically the lawnmower would be um, uh, ruminants, right? The animals walking around um, grazing. Um, and then it, it transitioned quickly to a, a wealth, a status, a wealth and status sort of thing. Uh, it costs a lot of money or you'd have to hire people to actually maintain your space. Um, so that came over with the European colonization of North America. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, most of the lawns in old Europe often were dominated by short wildflowers. Right? There's a whole variety. They'd, they'd love to have these like fields of purple, essentially, that were just really low. Um, somehow we transitioned away from that to these monocultures of cool season grasses. Um, and uh, a, a just total intolerance of weeds, you know, just, just uniform lawns. Well, um, it's pretty harsh on our, our soil and uh, really creates these ecological dead zones. Uh, granted, they can be aesthetically beautiful. I'm not totally trashing lawns. Uh, if I didn't know what I know about ecology, I might, you know, appreciate lawns a little more than I currently do. Um, they're great. I have kids. It's great for the, you know, to keep an open space for kids to run around and stuff. But by and large, we're basically giving up this amazing opportunity to, to be in nature, right? Um, even if you converted this to, to growing some food in your backyard, it's, it provides a lot more value than um, a lawn. Uh, and then often to, to, to manage a lawn, there's regular chemical and physical manipulations and inputs. Um, so um, they're just creating this pretty harsh, harsh environment for wildlife. I am going to try to sh to show this video for for those of you that um, appreciate economic value too. This is a cool little uh, primer on how biodiversity is good for the economy as well, not just for nature nerds like me. So I'm going to try to stop sharing this and open this up. Bear with me for just a moment, and then share again once I have it up in YouTube. All right, just one second. Can, can you guys still hear me? Yes, yes. You can't see the screen yet though, right? Not yet. Okay. So let's give this a go again. Oh, something's changing here. Can you see me? I can see way, uh, walruses, no, or seals on the beach. Yeah, can you hear it though? That's another important question. When I press play, can you guys hear this? No? No. All right, hey, no sweat. I'm gonna, uh, I will create a link for, for anyone who's interested here. I'm happy to share this. Just a cool little, um, just a quick little thing about um, whatever. It's, it's a cool little thing about how um, diversity 
in forests creates much more productive forests. Um, am I, is my screen still sharing with you all? We're seeing you, Mike. Okay. You have to go back to share yeah. screen. For some reason, okay, it accidentally minimized, okay. Forgive me, it's been a long day in the field. <laughs> um, okay, you guys back to the, the beginning. Back to the beginning. Oh, here we are, yes. All right, great. So yeah, for this, I'm, you know, for anyone who's jotting it down, you can see the link there, but um, I'm happy to share, share this later. Um, but anyway, one of the take homes is um, just a good diverse system is of great value. Different trees, different plants, different grasses have different strategies for extracting nutrients from the soil. And so um, if everything is the same, it's, it's going down the same depth, it's having the same strategy, it's really um, exacerbating the resources within one section of soil, which is not good. Um, if you imagine three different plants and one goes really deep, one goes really wide and shallow and one's kind of in between, then you have this matrix. And then also, I mean, we could talk, there's, a, there's entire grads, grad level classes just on um, mycorrhizae and soil fung, fungi and everything that happens at the forest floor or the, your backyard level. And so here's just some examples. Um, you see a couple leaves on the ground next to a tree and it looks that simple, just sweep it up and get it out of there. But I mean, this is what's going on. You have um, shallow soil microinvertebrates. You have all these detritivores, these insects that eat leaves and essentially make the nutrients in those leaves plant available, right? They're turning it into soil by eating it and pooing it out. It's, you know, they're turning carbonates into carbonites and, you know, they're making those chemical reactions that allow plants to reuse those nutrients. Um, so this is all unfolding right in your backyard. It's pretty exciting. So I had mentioned this before, just going back, reinforcing this idea that um, to garden for wildlife, food, shelter, water, um, a place to breed and a place to raise young. Um, and so, for example, I'm going to talk a little bit about my yard. Um, even though these are big spaces, this is an 800 acre wetland restoration site that I had the great pleasure of helping design and study and study after implementation, right? Adaptive management, adaptive ma um, maintenance. Um, we modeled after species that we wanted there, right? This on the far, on the bottom right, that's baby American bitterns. We wanted bitterns to breed here. So we planned the hydrology and the, and the plant species in the wetland area in hopes they would show up. And sure enough, they did. There's another picture of a bobolink we wanted to create these meadows that we thought they would use and we got lucky, they used them. And then wet woods for um, rusty blackbirds and migration. Those are the three examples there. But if you just, I mean, just setting fauna goals can really set the framework for the plant decisions you make. If you want monarch butterflies, you should plant Asclepius, right? Mo um, uh, milkweeds. And there's five different native milkweed species that occur in our region that are, and they're all stunning for their own reasons. Some like wet feet, some can handle shade, some love it in the open sun, et cetera. So um, it's just, it's fun to select your plants based on what sorts of cool wildlife you might like to experience. And again, mentioning that adaptive management, you can do this in your yard, right? You have a plan, you plan a bunch of things, something, let's say your rudbeckias, your, your, um, or your echinaceas, your coneflowers do way better than your, your asters. Um, maybe, you know, you, you go with that. You're not going to waste money and keep putting plugs in that die, right? Maybe it's what you had hoped would be there for some reason isn't working. It could be adapting something going on in the soil that you don't know without a deep chemical analysis, or it could be something as simple as, you know, too much shade, um, or, um, uh, upland versus wetland, right? You may have a, an area that's wetter than, than another. Um, so you can set your plants per that. So uh, I don't know how many of you guys get into the city, but this is this was a small pier called the Washington Avenue Pier. Um, this is the size of an average backyard. It's 0.25 acres. Um, and uh, it's this non-native pier, right? It's a man-made soil, concrete, rubble, and old bricks. Um, that, and interestingly, this was like Philly's Ellis Island. This was, uh, this was the um, 
the place where ships would come in and this was the immigration port for Philadelphia back in the 1800s. Um, so yeah, here's some cool information on that. You can see the soil there. It's a concrete brick, wooden cribbing. And uh, at that top, the, the, the darker organic portion of that, that's just years and years of organic development from it, the site being left fallow. That's pedogenesis, right? Um, allowing those insects to eat leaves and create soil, right? Um, so this is what it looked like when we started. It was trampled, it's non-native soils, a bunch of invasive plants. It was a dangerous sort of site. And uh, we designed it to basically, the reason I mentioned this is because I think this is a good example for what you could do with a, a small space using native plants. So basically we came up with all these rationales, right? Okay, birds that migrate through this space. It's an important migratory corridor. So we wanted to create, we wanted to plant plants that provide food and structure for birds in spring and fall, especially. Um, and so we went, if you look here, this looks very much like somebody gardening in their yard, right? This was the beginning of our project. So we put down seed in some areas. Um, we put down, uh, we planted a lot of trees and, and plugs, landscape plugs, trees, shrubs and landscape plugs, uh, and then mulched around some of those areas to keep them more formal. And then in other areas, again, it was just seed um, where we really wanted it to come in a little more wild. We had to set up our own little irrigation system and um, not long after this site is really robust with um, lots of gorgeous native plants. Um, in some areas, it has a sort of wild feel where some of the plant species get quite tall. In other areas, we intentionally made it small for you know that, that shot in the center there, that's Pycnanthema muticum. It's a native mint species. It grows uniform and short. Uh, it's below the belt, just above the knee about and uh, is absolutely stunning. It smells phenomenal. And it's a really, really hardworking pollinator plant. It puts out many hundreds of individual small flowers that many native bees and butterflies and moths and beetles uh, all uh, work very hard to get a piece of when they're blooming. And they bloom for a long period too. So it's quite nice. On the right is New York ironweed, stunning plant, grows very tall. There are some stunted varieties that, and in this setting, I think it would be appropriate for your garden if you want, if you really like this, but you didn't want it to be six and a half or seven feet tall. There's some stunted varieties, they call them native ours. Um, I speculate how much value they have for some of the um, animals that, that rely on some of the insects. The chemical composition might be a little different. Um, but yeah, so here we are collecting vegetative data in this space, it's just really stunning. I recommend you, you get out there if you get a chance um, and I love the faunal metrics, right? Just seeing a rat snake predate a songbird in this, on this place that was this, you know, really degraded peer system just shows the resiliency in nature. And that's just after one year. It's in a Sambucus canadensis, an elderberry that we planted there. Um, just stunning. So here's some of the nerdy data. You know, we had 49 plant species when we started, of which 35% were non-native. Now there's uh, over 170 plant species of which less than 7% are non-native. Um, and we just saw this huge increase in insect diversity, birds nearly doubled. Um, and uh, one of the insects that we got there was a rusty patch bumblebee, the same month that they designated it as a federally endangered insect. So that was really cool. You never know what's gonna pop up in your backyard if you plant some native plants. Um, here's some of the things we learned from that. Um, I don't know how I'm doing on time, so I'm probably going to speed up a bit. Um, I'm always long-winded, folks. Sorry about that. Um, but here's some of the things we learned from this project that were cool. One of the most important things is great inspiration for um, plants you can grow in your backyard. And we were thinking about just little plots in South Philly, like small little um, like row home backyards. So um, here's an example that might be applicable for some of you that have larger properties. This is a five-acre suburban property just a residential property in, in Montgomery County. And uh, you can see that we cleared this, we seeded it um, and no plugs. I don't think we put plugs. This was all just by seed. And by year three, this is what you get. These robust meadows, chock full of hummingbird clearing moths and tiger swallowtail butterflies. And I mean, you name it, it's a really stunning little meadow. And this could happen at any scale, right? This could be a 10 by 10 foot plot in your front yard or, you know, up to whatever, as many acres as you want. 
Um, I want to put in a plug for Edge Habitat. I did some long-term bird research at Longwood Gardens where my company's been doing, uh, we've been managing meadows and establishing these um, exclosures, these deer excluded um, reforestation areas. And we found that, you know, planting young trees and young shrubs with a bunch of wildflowers and native grasses underneath it provides huge value for birds. Even interior breeding birds like scarlet tanagers and oven birds will bring their young to these edges to find food because it's such important. There's such a, 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 an ample amount of insects and berries and seeds at different times of year, especially during the fledging season, summer and uh, early fall. Um, and then uh, Drexel Lodge Park, when I was on the EAC, we, we got a little example garden there. It's been managed and uh, there's a couple plant species in there I want to get pulled like butterfly bush. If you see that there, please don't plant that. It's, a, it's an invasive. Um, but uh, a lot of the plants in that, in the Drexel Lodge Park, just right by the pavilion there, are a great example of plant species that you could use in your own yard. Uh, Newtown Meadows Preserve, as Janet mentioned, we, I, I had the great pleasure of playing a role in the design for that. It's yet to be implemented, but what an amazing space. It has an amazing history of pasturing. And when you get back there into the rolling hills, you can't hear the highway. You can't see a bunch of buildings. It's really, truly an escape. And there's a great opportunity for grassland bird management. This is Dick Sissel, I photographed doing a logger at trike study just the other day, um, or not Dick Sissel, rather, Eastern Meadowlark, sorry. Um, this species could be there. And actually, this species might be, there might be a territory or two at Garrett Williamson, where we're going to be doing our bird walk on, on Saturday morning. And then Greer Park is the one that we're, we're currently finalizing a master plan for. And there will, in, in the design, there will be demonstration gardens to hopefully inspire you um, to do the same in your yard. Another great thing about doing this is once you establish native plants in your yard, it's your own native plant nursery. Every single year, these plants put out a lot of seed and you can do it Native American style or like one out of every seven plants you take some seed from and you'll still end up with a big bag of native seed at the end of the day. So, um, and you can give that away to friends. You can expand your meadow. Um, you, you can do all kinds of cool stuff with that seed. Um, so uh, that's a, a really fun thing. I got kind of hooked on collecting native seed and. I am thrilled to now have my own backyard where I can do this. So um, what you see is little snippets of my 62 species uh, list. I, um, you know, AES, we were recently acquired by Red, so we just changed the A to an R. Um, but we, we have native plant nurseries and you can see this list of um, 62 native species that I bought. Now, here's the thing. Our physiographic province, we're in, we're in the Piedmont where we are in Eastern Pennsylvania. Not all of these plants occur in Eastern Pennsylvania in the Piedmont. They're native to North America. Most of them are native to the Northeast. I know they'll grow uh, in, in my backyard, um, but I've expanded beyond. I've taken some creative liberties here because some of them are just so smoking gorgeous uh, that I, I want them there. So, so I'm taking some liberties within the plant palette of native plants to put things that I know won't expand out. You know, these aren't going to become invasive plants, right? They're, so it's so um, you can have fun with a garden using a palette of native plants. And I strongly encourage everyone to start with the ones that are appropriate to our region. It sounds like the pop-up garden is going to be a great example of that for you. Um, and anybody's welcome to come check out my garden after I, <laughs> I'm going to put 1,600 native plugs in the ground they arrived today, so um, and I, I'm on the road for work. But this weekend, right after the bird walk, I'll be on my hands and knees planting plugs all day. So um, uh, I hope uh, any of you who are interested can come by and check. You're more than welcome to come check out my my native garden in the backyard. Um, so just some take homes: minimize the monoculture lawn space. Do your best to plant natives where possible. Think about things that produce seeds and berries that provide value for mammals and, and birds. Um, not enough time to talk about deer and that's, you know, we have somebody wants to bring it up in, uh, in the discussion, but, um, you know, deer resist, some plant species are deer resistant. If you can fence your yard in, go for it because we, we have an overpopulation of deer and they will chew down a lot of your stuff if you don't protect them. Um, allow the dead standing material to stay as long as possible in the winter. Just try and embrace that aesthetic of you know, there's amber 
dead grasses. I think they're quite stunning, but they provide tons of value for birds in migration in the fall. So you typically mow in late winter um, and then you'll have that clean meadow every single year. Um, if you rake leaves, consider leaving them in mulch piles. That's where all your larval insects are. are. So you might, you'll break the cycle every year if you're constantly raking out all your leaves. So, but if you do want to clean up some areas, consider keeping that pile somewhere on in your lawn so those insects can get back into to your to your meadow each year. Um, be your own scientist, be patient, take notes, figure out what works, what didn't, and have fun with it. Um, invasive species, I barely, I barely touch on, they will show up. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a variety of methods for managing those. Um, and uh, happy to talk about those too, if anyone has specific questions. But that's it, I'm gonna pause because I've already went too long and I'm hoping folks have, aren't snoring and might have some questions or, or discussions. So here's my contact information. Please note again, it's not appliedeco.com anymore, it's res.us for my uh, email address. That's my office number. Um, happy to chat with anybody uh, after this. So thanks, thanks for your time. Well, Michael, that was very inspiring. Uh, and I've really learned a lot. Uh, and having gone through a lot of um, Zooms on these subjects, it's amazing how much still there is to be learned. So I really appreciated it. Uh, I, I, I have a, a Doug Ptolemy quote as well that I'll, I'll share. And that is, Doug Ptolemy says, follow the seven step rule. And that rule is, step seven steps away from the plant that you think an insect is eating and see if you really still notice those holes in the leaves because uh, you probably won't. And, uh, the, and we're supporting the native pollinators and the, as you say, the caterpillars that can only host, uh, only grow on, on their host plants. So this is very important. Something I realized that I, now that I'm into native plants is that as things are coming into bloom, it's not just the bloom that I'm looking at or the blossom, it is the bee or the insect that is visiting that, that little flower there. So I, I find myself uh, yep. e even more involved in, in what my garden is doing, making me feel good. Wonderful. Yeah, and again, as you had mentioned, there's, there's just, there's so much complexity. I mean. It, Ecology is the study of all living and non-living things and how they interact, right? And that's unfolding in your backyard, your front yard, whether you're managing a lawn or managing a woodland, right? It's still, all of that is trying to unfold. So I'm humbled every day I learn something new um, and uh, glad to share the little, little bit I know, but it's just, you know, it's just a cog in this complex wheel. So yeah, thanks for the opportunity to, to jaw flat. So we have a couple of questions here, Mike. Uh, the first one is, what are your thoughts on goldenrod and managing ability within a, oh, oh it went away, uh, within a, an urban or suburban uh, garden? So it depends on the goldenrod, right? There's 15, if not more, native solidago species. And then some uh, euthamia graminifolia is grass leaf goldenrod. Um, <clears throat> I'm, when you say, goldenrod and manageability within the suburban garden, I say it's phenomenal. So Solidago rigosa, Solidago nemoralis, Solidago juncia, they all work astoundingly. Oh, and odorata, which smells like anise. It's a really wonderful mm -hmm. smelling plant. All four of those species do really well in just about any soil in our region. Um, and they, they, so nemoralis can get almost like weedy, if you will. It can start to outcompete some other plants. Um, and the, the way to manage that is just clip some seed heads, but you know, clip the flowers before they go to seed if you wanna slow that, that proliferation down. Um, and that's good for all plants if you wanna manage a, a clustered area. Um, but um, Solidago canadense uh, is considered to be, a, a, it behaves almost invasively. It's an aggressive native plant, which is a good thing because it outcompetes a lot of non-natives but also can be pretty aggressive. But again, it's super important. The first time I did field botany at Penn was with Tim Block and Ann Rhodes. What an amazing resource. 
And I got way into pressing plants. They taught me how to press plants. And so I'm often bringing home samples and I'm using my field loop to look at these flowers and I'm finding these yellow crab spiders and yellow beetles that are the same exact hue and intensity of the, of the flowers uh, of goldenrod. They just have such a huge value, a wildlife value. Um, so I would say have fun with it. You know, the um, Solidago or Euthamia graminifolia likes wet feet. It does really well in, in like, you know, damp areas or rain gardens. Plant it right by your rain spout, you know? Um, great, great. And then there's a whole bunch of other cool ones. If you have some forest, you can use do cesia, uh, blue stem, or purple stem goldenrod, and also zigzag goldenrod do really well in the forest, so. And for the fall, they're a really important uh, food source. Absolutely. For Yes. Yeah. And on the heels of that, a lot of the Symphiotricums, formerly Aster genus, um, uh, New England Aster, um, uh, Symphiotricum umbilatus, uh, Lancia lady, Lancia latum. Uh, I, if you're interested, I can give you a, a laundry list of species um, that often, yeah, bloom later in the season and are super important for, for late season um, insects. So we have, an, uh, the first question was, what bird is on your hand in that last slide? Do you remember? Yeah, so that, that one I did do a little chat response to, but of course I'll never forget it. It's a, uh, it was previously known as a gray jay, Persorius canadensis. I think they recently and appropriately named it the Canada jay. Um, this is a um, amazing animal. It's in the Corvidae family. So ravens, all the jays, blue jay, green jay, uh, gray jay, uh, and then uh, our ravens and, and crows are all in the same family. They're really smart. These birds were called uh, campfire birds um, or uh, grease birds because the old pioneers and, like, that were working their way into the woods would encounter these birds and they're really smart. And especially in the dead of winter when there's virtually no food in the boreal forest, unless you're incredibly adaptive like these Canada jays, um, you're going to be opportunistic and get a free meal. So you get some, you know, a bunch of trappers or hunters and they have a campfire and they cook up a piece of bison meat and then throw the grease. They'd be licking this, this animal would be right on the edge of the campfires and befriending people and eating scraps and, and you know, licking the, the grease off the snow. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, cool animal. And same thing, similarly, you know, food adapted. I was out and I was, this is in the Bloomingdale bog in, which is a, a section of boreal forest in uh, the Adirondacks in, in New York. And I was able to lure that bird over with a little bit of seed in my hands. And that's uh, yeah, pretty cool. So here's a question about native violets. Yeah. Uh, I've let native violets grow in my garden, but I haven't seen any fritillaries yet. How long will I have to wait for them to appear? So I, I love that you're letting Viola sororia and whatever other native violets appear in your on your property um, even some non-native violets that aren't invasive they don't behave invasive but are exotic could are important nectaring uh, plants because they flower so early in the season so a lot of solitary bees bee fly mimics and a couple other cool insects rely on those um, when asking about the fritillaries I am a vertebrate biologist. I am amazed with uh, insects and I've, I actually do participate in a variety of insect surveys. I can ID meadow fritillary. I've done studies with regal fritillary out um, at the um, military site uh, toward Indian Town Gap. Um, and I've seen other fritillary species in the Midwest, but I am not uh, super familiar with their direct association with violets. I would assume maybe that their caterpillars consume Violet leaves, I would say if you have, I would, I would suggest just divert, keep, keep your, your violets and think about providing some other native plant species to create that diversity effect that may um, ultimately attract a, a female. I would imagine maybe great spangled fritillary is the one that, um, that's our most common one in the region. Um, you know, that might attract a female that's already um, gravid to nectar, and then she could oviposit if she sees your violets, right? So maybe lure her in with other plant species, other wild native wildflowers for nectaring, and that might lure her, convince her to say, hey, look, there's a 
there's a violet I should oviposit on and lay, lay our eggs. Good luck. So, a smorgasbord. Create yeah, right. a smorgasbord. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so here we have, uh, I haven't seen acorns under my white oak. Is there anything I can do about that or am I just missing them? So great question. Um, the North American forest, one of the true heritages of North America is our mass producing trees. Oaks, hickories, and the almost gone American chestnut. These supported just an amazing diversity of mammals and birds, some of which are extinct that really relied on these trees, um, including the passenger pigeon. Um, <clears throat> sometimes oaks, uh, so the, they have mast producing years. So you, you might have a white oak that will only create acorns once every five or six years. So maybe you're missing them, but it's often quite evident when they are because they'll, you know, the, the, the branches get heavy with acorns. And then you should notice an increased activity in birds, especially blue jays. Blue jays are amazing uh, uh, foresters, right? They'll, they, they cache food and gray jays do the same with species in the boreal forest. They cache as much food as they can. So they're spending all day, especially in the fall, hiding food that they can hopefully revisit and, and eat in the, in, the, uh, in the winter and early spring when there's not a lot of plant available food sources, but they're not, I mean, they're smart, but they're not me and you, right? So they, the average recovery rate of the acorns that they hide is less than 30%. So 70% of them are, are left in nature and often they're jamming them into the ground. So, um, you know, they're, they're planted, they're essentially planting white oaks. Um, I would say you might have an overpopulation of deer, which is very likely, and other small mammals that are um, eating the acorns before they're very evident to you. Um, but most of the smaller mammals, you'll see the evidence, like squirrels love eating acorns. I've tried to eat white oak acorns. They're very bitter, not too tasty, <laughs> but I do know some, I have some friends that, that do make like a, um, they make things using acorns. They powder it up and make like a dough of sorts. Um, but, uh, you know, often you'll see like the cores poured out shells when, when, uh, as evidence. So I'm not certain. And, uh, that's actually, a, a, you have an interesting conundrum there. I would say just wait a couple more years. Um, and, uh, if you still don't see them buy another oak species, you know, uh, or buy another white oak and plant it nearby. Um, perhaps, um, um, Dr. Raro, Native Plant Nursery, has wonderful uh, local genotype for trees and shrubs. And, um, you know, buy yourself a nice another white oak and plant it and see if you see something different. So well, I don't think I see another question here. Um, I do see a hand raised. Oh, I also, do. I'm, I can't figure out how to do I did say allow. Uh, is that Cindy? Are you? Probably. And hey, while you're trying to get Cindy to chat, I do see one more. It says herbicides and pesticides sprayed All on right. lawns, the largest source of water pollution. An overuse of herbicides and any use of pesticides are absolutely deleterious. I, can, I wholeheartedly agree. Pesticides just shouldn't exist, frankly. Um, and the, one of the things I've been doing a lot of research on regenerative agriculture um, and uh, you know, areas that, you know, let's take a square mile of wheat when it might attract dick thistles that are breeding there. The way that the hayfield getting combined at the wrong time destroys that bobbling population, the chemical kill of grasshoppers and all these other things in a wheat field will destroy all the breeding bird nests as well. So um, it's, it's sad, frankly. And, you know, there's the neonicotinoids tend to they persist, they persist in the landscape. And yeah, they end up even, you know, they end up in the streams, they end up still on the food after process. Like it's really not, it's no, no bueno. And what we've learned is if you let nature come back, instead of constantly fighting and pushing away and tilling and controlling, if you allow for that diversity, guess what happens? You get insects that hunt the pest insects. You get birds that hunt the pest insects they are controlled naturally and you don't have to spend the money and risk all these carcinogens, blah, blah, blah. It's really a, 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 a positive feedback loop of negativity when you're using chemicals and all these mechanical interventions 
to break something that's that's already so positively interwoven. You know, just embrace nature and have patience, and and it, it does the work for you. The ecosystem service of pest management. Yes. Um, there was nobody to manage all of those uh, insects 200 years ago, and things grew fine. Yeah. How about 10,000 years ago? Oh, well, that's you know, true. Indigenous <laughs> Americans did a fine job of growing food, you know? Yes. So, Nick, could you put up that last slide that I uh, was interested in sharing with everyone? Yes. Um, uh, did Cindy get a chance to? I, I don't see her over here anymore. Cindy, you should be able to talk unless you're on mute. It looks like she may have. Well, it looked like it was. No. Some, oh, oh I, I didn't. I didn't have anything to say. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm sure you do. <laughs> no, well, I just. I, I love what you had to say, Mike, and, and I've been reading a number of books that uh, just totally echo your points. I've been listening to okay. the audiobook of The Overstory. Okay. Have you heard of that book? I've not. Novel. Oh, it's by a Pulitzer Prize winning author, and it, it was inspired by the destruction of the Redwood Forest out west. Mm -hmm. And this author just fell in love with trees when sure. he wrote this book and it's yeah. it's about trees and the impact on people's individual lives the their contributions to us to mankind yeah. the, so it's the overstory and i highly I, recommend I, it and I then i was just reading another book about the pine barrens by uh, a local author and you said you had worked in the pine barrens and then when you talk about regenerative regenerative agriculture Several years ago, I had read a book called The One Straw Revolutionary. Mm. Have, are you familiar with that? You know, I'm not. And uh, I'm, I'm doing a disservice by not plugging Gabe Brown in his book and Alan Williams in his work, because those are my co-researchers on these projects. One Straw Revolution. I feel like I've heard of it, but I've yet to read it. So. Actually, it's The One Straw Revolutionary. It's okay. the philosophy and work of Mana, Masanobu Fukoko. Uh, a Japanese man who it's kind of philosophical and environmental and he it's all regenerative agriculture and that the soil should be so rich yeah. that you never need to plow it and you can just take That's one it. straw and push it into the soil yeah when the soil is treated properly I mean it's, it's so true that I mean if, if anyone I recommend you to I mean we're all students until we're gone from this world Soil science is astounding. Most soils have enough nutrients to support plants for centuries, centuries and centuries, right? It's, it's, it's a long-term, imagine as a bank account that you just can't touch, you know? And plants harvest just a little bit and put so much back in. And it's really this self-sustaining thing until we start plowing and putting the same exact plant species over and over and over again, exacerbating the nutrients at a certain level, simplifying the, the microbiota and the fungi, eliminating its water holding capacity, eliminating its ability to sequester organic carbons, which is a global issue, you know? Um, so yeah, soils are really the living, breathing, you know, that's, it's, it's the key to all of this. And, um, you know, the, the, I again, I, there's going to be a documentary coming out that I'm I'm in uh, related to adaptive multi paddock grazing, and we we some of the people that have been some of these ranchers, these men and women that have been in, involved in this study for five to six years now, some of them even longer. They're pioneers. They've been doing it for 15 years. You know, they they essentially said, hey, you know, we went from focusing on you know raising healthy cattle. So, you know, to get our numbers up to make sure we're making a living selling beef or whatever, to becoming soil, we manage soil. We're soil farmers and the byproduct are these amazing healthy animals, right? And uh, so just no pesticides, no herbicides, using native plants, sometimes overseeding with annual forbs that are not invasive, but are good to complement the diet. And then mimicking the practice of bison aggressively foraging and rotating and then being off the landscape for 15 or at least 60 to 90 days, like cycling these cattle through their pastures. And they're really managing the soil, the soil, the, the, and uh, 
it's astounding. You know, it's really humbling to see how when we respect soil, the great rewards we get instead of fighting it all the time and creating these negative impacts for not just us, but our neighbors, right? The collapse of the Chesapeake Bay is from a mismanagement of farmland in the Susquehanna River shed, right? You know, right. Lidditz PA is ground zero. Pollution of the... Yeah, non-point source pollution from millage, right? You till the land and then you lose all that. That's, you're losing the, the dust bowl, right? This, this happened, I don't know how many times, how many times we have to repeat the same mistakes, you know? <laughs> the dust bowl was because we, we exacerbated the mineral soil, we lost the mineral soil, or we lost the topsoil and then, you know, created a, essentially an ecological desert that caused people to starve to death, you know? So Nick, did you find that last slide? Yes, um, let me pull that up real quick here. And I, I appreciate some of these other comments. Joel Salatin's amazing and is a collaborator on some of the projects I'm working on. Again, phenomenal resource for this for the agricultural side of things. Right. So this side I wanted to just uh, share with uh, our viewers. Uh, if you're getting started, just getting started on how to plan your native plant garden, uh, the, the beginning search uh, for audubon.org, and then you can uh, uh, type in plants for birds. It will give you a list of plants for your zip code that you can start with. And also valleyforgeaudubon.org, uh, go to Backyards for Nature. Uh, and again, it will give you a plant designs or a garden design that, that's very helpful for just getting started. Uh, and then uh, if you have a particular plant that you want to uh, find out about, uh, Lady Bird Johnson's Wildflower Center is a really good place. They, they have a wealth of plants from all across the, uh, the United States for what areas you're, you're living in. And then Bringing Home, Nature Home by Doug Ptolemy is a book that I heard about many times before I purchased. And it, it is the book that I take with me whenever I'm out looking for plants to see which ones he mentions because I will always uh, buy something that is on his list. And his website, Homegrown National Park, is about converting our yards to uh to or, or a portion of our yards or just along your fence line and you know what even if you only have space for a container garden the the butterflies the moths will find it they will be there they will reward you and please visit our local gardens tyler arboretum who's been helping us uh is in delaware county jake's arboretum is over in denver i mean devon that's not far away Chanticleer, just up here in Wayne. Mount Cuba Center is a native plant, and that's just across the border in Delaware. And Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve up in New Hope. So there's so many places for us to gather uh, plants from and, and learn from. And again, for uh, purchasing in our area, Mustardis is a wonderful place to start. And then Red Bud in media has native plants as well. So I'm hoping that you are as motivated as uh, I am, as we are, to, to start your own uh, native plant garden. And please come visit this weekend our um, pop-up garden that's opening at the Township Building. And Mike mentioned about the bird walk, uh, which has reached its capacity for this coming Saturday. But maybe if we Beg a lot, he will do another one for us at some time. <laughs> but uh, thank you all. I, I really, uh, uh, this went so well, at least I felt it went really well. And, and we will we'll look forward to seeing you again on the 12th. And thank you, Mike. Thank you, Nick, for keeping it all running smoothly. Hey, yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay, thank you. Well, I've got to come visit your yard. I do better. <laughs> oh, you have to tell me where you live. Yeah, and I mean, you'd come by in the afternoon on Saturday and drink a beer and put a plant in the ground if you'd like. <laughs> Sounds like fun. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'm going to sign off now. Yeah, bye-bye. Right. Bye now. Thank you, Nick. Yep, thank you. <laughs>
Cái này 